increase the lighting in the room. So, I, I don't think we can. I think uh, the sun is changing. Like at max. Yeah, Bharat Bhai, now we are on. We are live now. Yeah, so you can see me, na? Because I am not. I am only seeing Dr. Mathur's slide. Oh, sir, we can see you. Two minutes. We can I see you. Two minutes, guys. Anyway, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of uh, GPA, I welcome you all to this multi-speciality CME that is held on today, seventeenth December. And I'm very pleased that I have my colleague, versatile Dr. Preeti Bhargav, who will be our coordinator. And we have four esteemed speakers today, like Dr. Mathur, Dr. Devani, Dr. Sarath Seth, and Dr. Navita Purohit. May I now request uh, Dr. Preeti Bhargav to proceed? Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhart. And. On behalf of General Practitioners Association, Greater Bombay, I welcome all audience here today and speakers, of course. Our first topic for the day is recent advances in severe asthma management by Dr. Rajiv Mathur. Dr. Rajiv Mathur has spoken to us on a number of occasions. He is a postgraduate teacher and guide for medical graduates training for DNB in respiratory diseases member of Indian Chess Society and AMC. His areas of interest include bronchoscopy, sleep disorders, lung disease, and chronic respiratory failure, etc. He received the Rajnanda Pulmonary Disease Research Fellowship in 1993. He is a member of British Thoracic Society at Glenfield Hospital, UK. He has sleep medicine fellowship at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, Sydney, Australia, and at St. Thomas Hospital in London, UK. And at present, he's director of pulmonology department in Jaslok Hospital, Mumbai. So, thanks, Dr. Rajiv sir. Mathur, I welcome you. Uh, I will stop thanks. sharing the slide. Yes, I will stop. Yes. Right. Uh, thank you, doctor, for a, a very kind introduction. So I thought today, uh, for all our general practitioners, I thought I would just give a sort of an update on basically on management of severe asthma and also some sort of an update on the pathophysiology. Because when we were all in medical college, the asthma pathophysiology was uh, was very much different from what it is today. So I think let's go over the slides quickly. And the take home messages would be, as far as management is concerned, how you can improve your management. And secondly, a little better understanding of the underlying pathophysiology of asthma today. Majority of patients with asthma, in a majority of patients with bronchial asthma, we can achieve disease control with standard controller therapy. I think you would all agree with that. Approximately 5% of all the asthmatics that we treat will have severe asthma. And this severe asthma sometimes remains inadequately controlled in spite of standard treatment of high dose inhaled corticosteroids and lava. It is in this group of severe asthma with which remains uncontrolled that biologic therapy is needed as an add-on to achieve control. The ERS and the ATS, both big giants have concorded in the definition of severe asthma and they have defined severe asthma as asthma that requires treatment with high-dose inhaled corticosteroids along with the LABA 
with or without addition of systemic corticosteroids to maintain control or severe asthma is despite the above therapy it still remains uncontrolled in both these situations which i have just mentioned in severe asthma biologics can be used to achieve control inherent to the ers and ats definition severe asthma definition comes with some riders or qualifications number 1 the definition mandates that the diagnosis is confirmed because there are many diseases that can mimic asthma number 2 before we make a diagnosis of severe asthma all comorbidities should be addressed comorbidities such as g reflux sinus disease non compliance all should be addressed before we label a patient as severe asthma i think this is very important part of the inherent definition of severe asthma so i think the ease with which one can confirm the diagnosis of asthma is on a good history and clinical examination this is what i have been doing from day one and i am doing it today also absolutely a history and clinical examination particularly in settings where access to pft is not always available so a fluctuating cough breathlessness or wheeze worse at night and early mornings at times with increased mucus production on a background of personal atp or family otp would identify asthma in most of these most of our cases confirmation of asthma should be sought by a pft whenever it's available and classically pft shows a variable air flow obstruction and the best way to show variable expiratory obstruction is to use a peak flow meter a spirometry which shows obstructive ventilation defect with significant bronchodilator reversibility is also a hallmark of diagnosis of asthma in our pft lab at jeslo we also do test for exercise induced asthma by making the patient run on the treadmill at 80% of the predicted heart rate and documenting several spirometric for the next 45 minutes post exercise to look for a fall in fev1 and efr now coming to confirming the diagnosis there are several conditions that mimic asthma and cause wheezing and it is true i'm sure all of you have heard that everything that wheezes is not asthma upper airway obstruction by laryngeal tumor may cause wheezing but inspiratory stridor is usually audible vocal cord dysfunction is another psychosomatic entity where subconsciously patients tend to adduct the cords during inspiration and this can mimic asthma left ventricular failure can present with only wheezing believe me only wheezing and one should always evaluate cardiac functions in an elderly patient presenting with asthma and wheezing for the first time tropical eosinophilia common in india i am sure as family physicians you must have dealt with hundreds of cases can easily get mixed up with first time asthma in a non atopic subject look for the high eosinophil count and sometimes fleeting shadows on an x ray copd i am sure can be made out by one and all by its onset late in life beyond 50 or 60 a reduced air entry and the hallmark of clinical diagnosis of copd which i myself find most useful are hearing early inspiratory crackles at the basis along with some amount of expiratory wheezes rarely systemic vasculitis including chirps frogs eosinophilic pneumonias present with wheezes but 
in these situations, there is a multi-system involvement. Lastly, foreign bodies and bronchial tumors can cause localized wheezing. Confounding pack before labeling the patient as severe asthma, all confounding factors and comorbidities have to be addressed. As I told you, this is part of the definition. <clears throat> all these comorbidities contribute to respiratory symptoms, flare-ups, and even the quality of life. First, compliance with medication, and especially inhaler technique. Inhaler technique in my opinion, has to be personally demonstrated by the doctor. And I myself personally keep checking on the first couple of follow-ups that the patient has learned to take inhalers correctly. Gastroesophageal reflux. Cough receptors at the lower end of the esophagus, when stimulated by gastric acid, can cause a reflux cough or bronchoconstriction in patients who are symptomatic of GE reflux. Giving only proton pump inhibitors is not the only answer, and all anti reflux measures, including elevation of the head end of the bed and small frequent meals, should also be instituted as part of treatment. Chronic rhinosinusitis, with or without nasal polyposis, needs to be actively treated and is commonly seen actually in most patients of severe asthma. And if we are have to have better control, we need to treat the rhinosinusitis concomitantly. Heart failure, as I have already mentioned, can worsen pre-existing asthma and you need to sometimes increase the diuretics and vasodilators. Obstructive sleep apnea, then depression and anxiety are part and parcel of asthma and the anxiety associated, the depression associated with asthma can make asthma itself worse. Certain fluid overload states need to be assessed like chronic renal failure. When you have excess fluid in the system, you will also tend to have bronchial asthma. So these need to be assessed and treated with appropriate diuretics. <laughs> now coming to some simple questions, how, how common is, is severe asthma? Almost this is a Dutch study where they found about 24-25% of the patients have severe asthma. And amongst this 25%, about 3.75% of as severe asthma patients have uncontrolled asthma. 3 to 10%, I would say closer to 5% of all asthma patients have severe asthma. A small percentage, definitely a very small percentage, but it is responsible for increased morbidity and it is also responsible for 50% of direct and indirect costs associated with all asthma. So it carries a very high load in terms of costs. Such patients of severe asthma face a reduced quality of life. Among them, 92% of them have a normal daily activity which are impacted more than once per day. They have a 10 times higher risk of hospitalization. Although mainly an increase in morbidity is seen in chronic severe asthma, there are some studies which show that there is some amount of increased mortality also as far as severe asthma is concerned. Now, very quickly, I just wanted to share with you some asthma facts uh, related to our Indian environment. This was an elegant study in 2015 by Salvi et al, et al which showed that almost 90% of asthmatic patients whom they surveyed, they perceived their asthma to be under control when actually speaking, they do not have well-controlled asthma. 66%, that means almost two-thirds of asthma patients which they surveyed had experienced some exacerbations everywhere. They had an average of about eight exacerbations per patient per year, which lasts for about four days on an average. 42% of asthmatics in India make emergency visits and 18% require hospitalizations every year. All these are, are considerably higher figures 
high figures showing that more or less severe asthma is not yet treated adequately in our, in our conditions. 64% of all asthmatics have incorrect use of the device, and this is not surprising. This is another study of the Armed Forces Medical College. This was a very earlier study in 2005. But just to tell you that they found almost 30% of severe asthma patients requiring oral corticosteroids. And the main reasons for ineffective inhalation therapy in their study was underuse of inhaled steroids and incorrect use of inhaler devices. This was another study, multi-center study, in, carried out in cities of Ajmer, Delhi, Kolkata, Rorkela, Chennai, Mangalore, Mumbai, and Rajkot in the year 2011, where a large number of patients were looked at on questionnaire survey. And what was striking was that oral steroids were used in the, in the previous year by almost 90% of the patients. Okay, 90%. And on average, patients reported using oral steroids up to 10.5 times a year. Inhaler therapy was seen in 44% of patients, which was not too bad. As far as severe asthma in India is concerned, almost 40% of all asthmatics are uncontrolled and have severe asthma, with 67%, that is two-thirds of all severe asthma patients, having more than two exacerbations per year. 58% of all asthmatic, severe asthmatic patients had increased in peripheral eosinophilic count. And this is the group of patients whom we call as severe eosinophilic asthma. This was our own study, which was carried out by me and uh, the late Dr. J.R. Shah at Jaslo, where we were part of a cross-sectional worldwide questionnaire survey from 233 countries in age group of 13 to 14 year old school children and 97 countries in six to seven year old school children. We had recruited 14 centers all over India. We looked at 55,815 13 to 14 year olds and 50,000 six to seven year old who underwent a questionnaire survey. And what did we find? The prevalence of asthma among school children in India is around 5.6% in 13 to 14 year olds and 4.5% in six to seven year olds. That means roughly you can remember the figure that 5% of school children in India do suffer from asthma. Now, if you look at the world map, India is considered a low prevalence area because the prevalence is only 5%. The high prevalence areas are UK, Australia, and New Zealand, which almost have a prevalence of 15 to 20%. However, one interesting fact of our study was brought out. The proportion of visas, that means asthmatics, with severe asthma was high. That is to say, 42% of asthmatics which were surveyed showed symptoms of severe asthma in six to seven year olds, and 48%, that means almost half of the 13 to 14 year olds which, was, which were questioned had severe asthma amongst the entire asthmatic population. So this showing that severe asthma is, is pretty much relevant to the Indian scenario. Now, current immunopathology has redefined asthma types. During our college days, we were told that asthma is intrinsic, extrinsic, allergic, non-allergic. So all those the terms have now been made redundant. And it is now recognized that there are two specific endotypes of asthma. You have the T2 high asthma and the T2 low asthma defined on the basis of expression of cytokines. Increased expression of IL-4, 5, and 13 by the CD4 cells or by the ILC2 cells is seen in T2 high asthma. Biologic therapy that we use is targets these inflammatory mediators in T2 high asthma. In T2 high asthma, approximately 
50% of asthmatic, many more in severe asthma, all have T2 high asthma. Here, inhaled allergens, microbes, even pollutants, you know, air pollution in many cities in India is quite high. It reacts with airway epithelium and through a cascade of events, the CD4 cells and ILC2 cells produce a huge amount of interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13. And these three interleukins activate the basophils, the eosinophils, the mast cells. They also cause an increased IgE by B cells. What happens? All these interleukins are result in bronchoconstriction, increased airway responsiveness, increased mucus production, and airway remodeling. So I think for the family physician, this is one key slide on pathophysiology, where today, up to now, we have been using inhalers to reduce inflammation of the bronchial mucosa and to reduce the bronchospasm, correct? In almost all our patients. What is the advance in asthma treatment today? The advance is we are now able to use by injections. We are now able to use by injectable sources where we are able to block these inter interleukins, which are produced in all allergic conditions. So if you are able to produce monoclonal antibodies against IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, then there is no chance of activations of basophils, isnophils, and mast cells, or even an increase in IgE by B cells. So I think one of the take-home messages is that today's treatment of asthma is coming down to the basic, I would say basic cytokine level. Okay. So if we are able to reduce the cytokines which are responsible for eosinophilic inflammation, mainly it is the eosinophilic inflammation that gets triggered and causes severe asthma or asthma of any kind. All the, all the effects of asthma that you see is basically because of these interleukins. So today's advancement in the management of asthma is to find IL-5, anti-IL, monoclonal antibodies which we can inject and block all these interleukins. So we are now at the base root, root cause of asthma and asthma exacerbation. And that's how treatment in the future years, believe me, in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, is going to change dramatically. On the other hand, T2 low asthma, uh, where the inflammatory mediators are not high, is neutrophilic. These kind of patients have fewer allergic symptoms, are less responsible to corticosteroids. They're older at the age of diagnosis. In T2 low asthma, uh, uh, biologics are not really indicated. They have not yet been prescribed for T2 low asthma. So you have standard controller therapy. You can uh, give them bronchial thermoplasty. And in one study has shown that uh, macrolide therapy in the form of uh, azithromycin given over 16 weeks can actually reduce exacerbations in T2 low asthma. Now, coming to this GINA guidelines, GINA guidelines tell us how to treat mild asthma, moderate asthma, and severe asthma. And right now, we are talking of severe asthma, so we are looking at step four and step five of the GINA guidelines. So I thought, let us make this lecture very simple. What would be my prescription and what would be maybe your prescription to your patient in severe asthma? So we look at step four and step five of GINA guidelines for severe asthma. And what should we prescribe? Suppose we have a severe asthma patient in front of us. The first drug is we must use a high dose inhaled corticosteroid with a long-acting beta, beta agonist. So you have high-dose inhaled corticosteroid in the form of fluticasone, budesonide, or piclomethasone, and a larva in the form of salmitrol or formitrol. 
And I think most of you are aware that there are many companies preparing many such combinations. And it is your choice. I'm not saying one is better than the other. But the first thing in the prescription of any severe asthma patient should be a high-dose inhaled corticosteroid with a lava. This in the form of an inhaler or even as a rotator. Now, suppose on the first step, if your patient is well controlled with severe asthma, fine, you can leave him on that. But most of these patients of severe asthma still remain in control after the number one in prescription. So what do you do? You add a short-acting beta agonist. So what you can do is add a salbutamol inhaler or rotacap. Tell the patient to use it as and when required. Or many times what I do is I tell them to take salbutamol or levosalbutamol, two puffs twice a day as a fixed dose. Inhale in addition, in addition to the high days inhale corticosteroid with lava. Number three, if suppose the patient is still not controlled with your first two steps, then we can add what is known as a lama or Tiotropium. Tiotropium is now in, has been in the market for a long time and it has been proved beyond doubt that Lama treatment with Tiotropium in children, adolescents and adults with severe asthma improves the FEV1, reduces loss of asthma control, increases the time to first exacerbation and definitely, and definitely has a beneficial effect on symptom control. Even the ERS and ATS recommendation for children, adolescents, and adults with severe asthma, uncontrolled despite GINA 4 and 5, addition of tiotropium is recommended. So number three would be you use the tiotropium inhaler, let us say two puffs once a day. Remember, tiotropium has a 24-hour effect. All right. So you use tiotropium once a day as an inhaler or even as a rotator. So this would be your third step. Still, you have put three steps into, into focus and your severe asthma patient still is not fully controlled. He's still symptomatic. What do you do? Yes, at this stage, you can add a theophylline. Theophylline has been with us for donkey's years. Very good drug today also. We can use, you know, old ancient preparations like derifylin retard, derifylin OD, or the newer preparation of Unicontin, which gives uh, a 24-hour release of, of theophylline. Theophylines are also good bronchodilators. In spite of addition of theophylline, if your severe asthma patient still continues to have symptoms, particularly allergic rhinitis, allergic symptoms, you add a leukotriene receptor antagonist. That means you add a Montelukast, 10 milligram once daily. So, your sample prescription or final prescription in most of my severe asthma, how does it read? Number one, uh, I'm not, you use the Seroflow, EasyFlow, I mean, you can use any company, but I'm just giving you an example. Seroflow or EasyFlow 250 microgram inhaler, you can use two puffs twice a day, or you can use a Formoflow inhaler, which has Formiterol, 250 microgram, two puffs twice a day, that's number one. Number two, as I said, you use the Tiova or Diet inhaler, that is the Lama, two puffs once a day. Number three, you can add, as I had mentioned, Astelin or Levolin inhaler, two puffs twice a day, plus give it as and when required. Number four, tablet Montelukast, 10 milligram once a day for the asthma, for the asthma, is also uh, recommended. Besides, it also covers up most of the allergic symptoms. And lastly, uh, the theophylline in the form of unicontin or derifylline. So you have a good prescription of at least five drugs trying to treat your patients. This is in concordance with GINA step four and step five. But suppose in spite of you giving all this treatment, your patient continues to have symptoms, continues to have exacerbations. What do you do? Then you have only two choices as per GINA 4 and GINA 5 guidelines. Either you can give him oral steroids or you can introduce biological therapy. That is what uh, you know, I, I had mentioned earlier. 
If you want to use oral steroids, fine. You can use prednisolone, 5 to 15 milligram daily or alternate day. You can use methyl prednisolone, 4 to 16 milligram daily or alternate day. But remember, long-term use of prednisolone, I'm sure all the family physicians know, gives rise to a range of side effects besides hyperacidity, osteoporosis, cataract formation, increase in, uh, in the eye pressures, uh, a whole host of com complications which the patient will have to suffer. And that's the reason why GINA4 and GINA5 guidelines today recommend you use biological therapy rather than oral steroids. And what biological therapy is available today to us, we can use omalizumab, mepolizumab, bendralizumab. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, all these three drugs which are available in India today, they all act at the root cause of the allergy. Omalizumab is an anti-IgE. That means it blocks the, anti the IgE levels, IgE uh, uh, antibodies in the blood. Mepolizumab and Benralizumab are anti-IL-5. That means they are monoclonal antibodies which block the action of interleukin-5. And as I had mentioned earlier in that key slide, interleukin-5 is responsible for stimulating the eosinophils and giving rise to a cascade of events that leads to eosinophilic inflammation and severe asthma. So if we are able to block at the base, at the root cause, at the interleukin level, you can imagine how much the patient will improve. Yes, omalizumab can be given for uncontrolled asthma who are uh, more than 12 years of age, uh, who have mainly uh, raised IgE levels. Mepolizumab, benralizumab, they are add-on maintenance for severe asthma in patients who are above 18 years, remember, not in children, with the eosinophilic phenotype. That means they have a little higher eosinophil count. The difference between mepolizumab and benralizumab is mepolizumab is available as an injection, 100 milligrams subcutaneously, but you have to give it every month. Benralizumab is given first three doses every month. And after those three doses every month, you use benralizumab every two months. That means the patient comes to you after every two months and takes one injection and is well. Is very well because the patients that we are treating now are responding Im immensely, severe asthma patients, to these <coughs> interleukin blockers. So, as a family physician, you would next ask me, Dr. Dr. Mathur, what, which one do we choose? Suppose we have a patient of severe asthma. Suppose he's not responding to the standard prescription I mentioned, right? And suppose now the choice is, do we add steroids or do we add biologics? And I want to use biologics. So which one do I use? It's a good question. I'm asking the question and I'm giving you the answer myself. Which biologic to use? So I thought I'd make up this slide to make it as simple as possible for the family physicians. What you do is, in your severe asthma patient, in your severe asthma patient who is not fully controlled, do a serum IgE, simple total serum IgE, and do a CBC. And in the CBC, you calculate the absolute eosinophil count. If the serum IgE is raised and the absolute eosinophil count is anything less than 150, then you choose omalizumab. However, if the serum IgE is normal, or if it is high, but the absolute eosinophil count is more than 150 cells, you can use mepolizumab or benralizumab. So basically what we, are, I'm, what we are getting at is, for eosinophilic severe asthma, you use the anti-IL-5s, that is mepolizumab or benralizumab, because they will act at the level of interleukin-5. They are all monoclonal antibodies for interleukin-5 block the interleukin at the base level and thereby prevent allergic eosinophilic inflammation. So as family physicians, when would you like to initiate biologics in severe asthma? So I have just formulated some clinical criteria. So we all see patients on an OPD basis. So if you see a patient A with severe asthma 
uncontrolled on your regular therapy, means on the therapy which I just mentioned, that patient would certainly qualify for biologics. Number two, if your patient has a need for intermittent or continuous oral corticosteroid to achieve asthma control, definitely he would be a candidate for biologics. If you have your patient of severe asthma who seems to be who seems to be very well controlled, but does have frequent exacerbations more than two, two per year, yes, this patient will also qualify for biologics. And number four, there is a subset of patients with nasal polyposis and severe eosinophilic asthma with a low FEV1, which shows an enhanced response to benralizumab. And as far as your investigations are concerned, you just need to measure the CBC and absolute eosinophil count, and you can use biologics if your absolute eosinophil count is anywhere above 150. So I think this also is a good summary for, for all of you of when do you want to initiate biologics in your patient of severe asthma. So once you have detected, once you have decided which one to use, a choice is there that you can make a specialist referral for initiation of biologics under supervision. Because the therapy is new, it's not that these injections are going to create any issues, but because the therapy is new, at the moment, <clears throat> I'm calling the patient to just look hospital and giving the injection, you know, at the casualty and making sure the patient is all right for the next half an hour, one hour, and then sending him home. Not that it is required. If you look at the data in USA and Europe where biologists have been used for five or six years, patients even inject themselves at home. Just like you use insulin at home, they give themselves a, uh, biological injections at home. So that's how safe it is. But because in our scenario, this is one way where you could make a specialist referral for initiation of biologists for any of your patients, where we would do a baseline CBC, a total IgE, and we would also do a spirometry. And normally we repeat it at every four months and then at yearly intervals. Once we are sure the patient is doing well and react and there are no adverse reactions, all subsequent injections can be given by the family physician under their care. So the patient is returned back. The benralizumab has an advantage, as I said, where you need to give only one injection every two months. Whereas mepalizumab, you give one injection once a month. How do we assess whether your biologics are working? I think that is the next question. First thing that you'll notice is that there is an improved quality of life. The patient is able to sleep better, does not have bronchoconstriction at night, doesn't have to wake up feeling breathless in the early morning. Number two, his work output is better. He is not so clinically depressed or anxious about his illness. So that's a huge improvement in quality of life. Number two, reduce asthma exacerbation. The patient will tell you earlier on, I used to have five to six exacerbation of asthma. Once the biologics have started, we have seen almost a zero exacerbation of asthma. Improvement in FEV1. If you can measure an FEV1 on a spirometry before starting biologics, I have myself seen in most of my patients a fairly good response and one or two patients have had even a normal spirometry. And lastly, the fourth assessment is reduction in dose or withdrawal of corticosteroids. So if the patient is on daily or intermittent oral corticosteroids, once the biologics are started, that's the first thing that I do. I start reducing, tapering the, the oral corticosteroid, bring it down to zero, and we are always successful in that. First, you reduce the oral corticosteroid, then you reduce the theophylline, then you reduce the uh, leukotriene receptor antagonist, then you reduce the inhalers. <coughs> and ultimately, patients are on biologics, maybe on one or two inhalers. So that's how uh, good it can get. How do we respond? We always check for quality of life and exacerbations in lung functions, uh, at the end of four months and we are sure at that time who are the super responders in which we can continue intermediate responders are those who do show some response but not a very good response for such patients you can continue for a year 
and then reassess at that point of time. There is a small proportion of patients reported in literature who are non-responders because, <coughs> sorry, there are other uh, factors which are which are responsible for their severe asthma, which may not be uh, uh, made out on history, and they fall into the category of non-responders in which at, at, at four months you can discontinue the biologics. The next question I'm sure all family physicians would ask is, if you start a biologics doctor, how long can we use it? So we have benralizumab, which has proven results for five years. Five years safety profile has been shown in biologics. And as far as the exacerbations go, in the first year, 63% of patients have no exacerbations. Second year, 74% have no exacerbations. And by the time you achieve Year five, 87% of patients will report no exacerbations. So summing it up as key summary points, remember, eosinophilic airway inflammation is central to the exacerbation pathogenesis and poor symptom asthma control. Number two, targeting eosinophilic inflammation with benralizumab reduces the exacerbations, improves asthma control, and maintenance oral corticosteroid use in severe eosinophilic asthma. Number three, important to remember that benralizumab or anti-IL-5s are equally effective in atopic and non-atopic eosinophilic asthma. That means whether you have a serum IgE which is normal or high, but provided your absolute eosinophilic count is more than 150, your anti-IL-5 like benralizumab is going to work. Then there is an extensive long-term safety data from abroad. Of course, in India, we have just started this year. But as far as benralizumab is concerned, over 67,000 patients have been studied. And there have been no, uh, no real adverse effects. And the advantage of using benralizumab over mepolizumab is that it is the only biologic which requires one injection every two months rather than once a month. Future of biologics, I would say, is very bright. There is a stage where from subcutaneous uh, biologic, you may come to a situation where nebulized biologic therapy may be available in the years to come. There are recent animal studies of using anti-IL-13 monoclonal antibodies to terminal bronchioles in rats, in animal rats, and they have shown uh, a fairly good improvement. So before I end today's talk, I would just like to uh, highlight that number one, uh, using biologics should be carefully used. Today, it is recommended in severe asthma who are uncontrolled. But my personal feeling is that as time goes by, the choice of biologics would even go to moderate asthma, severe asthma patients who can be given biologics. Patients can reduce their inhaler therapy. And many patients may prefer taking, let's say, an injection once in two months and use an inhaler off and on. So the change of treatment of asthma we at a threshold is occurring. And over the next few years, you may find now that the treatment of asthma is towards the basic cause that is the inter at the interleukin level. So I end my talk here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, for that very lucid talk. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate uh, the time management, uh, your dot in time. Uh, however, there are quite a few questions. We will take a few so that we don't tread on the next speaker's time. Uh, let me read from the chat box. Is there any blood test for IL-4, 5 and 13 level? No, there is, there is, there is, no, there is no blood test. For these, because these are see, these are interleukins produced by this at the cellular level, so they are not, they are only at the cellular level of the bronchial mucosa. Actually, they don't, they don't transgress that level and get into the blood, but their effects, their effects of allergic inflammation in the form of a high eosinophilic count is how you, how you at the moment how we, how we predict that these interleukins are high when you find a high eosinophilic count and all the effects of asthma that are there. But no, blood tests are not possible. 
what is the dose of azithromycin in low type 2 asthma? Yes, see, azithromycin, they have tried uh, as, and in, in, in fact, if you read the GINA guidelines, azithromycin forms part of the treatment of severe asthma when you're going through, as I mentioned, theophylline and this and that. Some centers give 16 weeks of azithromycin or clarithromycin. And the basis of that is, number one, it sort of helps to clear any sort of infective etiology. And infective etiology, what is believed is that atypical organisms and maybe some sort of viral organisms are responsible for exacerbation in severe asthma in a proportion of patients. And I think it is in this group where you are continuously using azithromycin, it does not have that much of an anti-inflammatory effect as it has an anti-infective effect. So some anti-inflammatory effect and some anti-infective effect, that's how I would say would be the basis of, of azithromycin. Is there a role of bronchial thermal ablation? Yes, bronchial thermoplasty is practiced now uh, very gradually. That is also coming up. Uh, you can use that as an alternative, maybe an alternative to biologics also, where we put in a catheter through a bronchoscope and burn out the tissues, you know, uh, of the bronchial mucosa. And it is an effective form of therapy, but each catheter, I think, costs a lot. The costs are, costs are huge, but yes, one can consider it. As time goes on, maybe bronchial thermoplasty will become more and more freely available. So you can choose a surgical way of trying to treat your chronic asthma versus a biological way. So one last question. Uh, you said for bendralizumab and meplarizumab, uh, the criteria is actually eosinophils, eosinophil count. So what is the need of doing IgE? Can we just not do CBC? And if eosinophil count is less than 150, then we do the IgU. IgE to see if we need to use the other one. Yes, I'll tell you the reason I said IgE is it is not for the anti-IL-5. And for anti-IL-5, whether the IgE is normal or high, you're going to use an anti-IL-5 if the eosinophil count is more than 150, correct? Right, right. The, the only reason I mentioned uh, IgE is because there are a subset of patients who will have a very high IgE level, but have a normal or low normal eosinophil count. So those are the patients where you will use omalizumab, that is an anti-IgE. So differentiating uh, omalizumab or an anti-IgE preparation from an anti-IL-5, that's the only reason why you would do uh, total IgE levels. So we could do CBC. If the eosinophil counts are less than 150, then we do the IgE. Is that fine? Sorry, what did you say? We do the CBC count for eosinophils. And if the count is less than 150, then we can do the IgE. Yes, perfect answer. Yes, you can do it that way. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. That was, Thank you. Thank yeah, you. you have a lot of uh, messages thanking you for this wonderful talk. Thank you, sir. So you need to stop sharing your slides. Madam. Uh, yeah, uh, the, I am not able to uh, make his slides. Uh, yeah, he needs to stop sharing his slide. Madam, uh, second talk is by Dr. Sharad said he has to live for some yeah, yeah. emergency. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> our second speaker for the day is uh, Dr. Sharad Seth. And I have been, I, I think it is my uh, privilege that I know him for a number of years now. Uh, he is going to talk on renal safety in type 2 diabetes mellitus. At present, he is a consultant Nephro uh, and head of department of nephrology at Kukila Band Hirubai Ambani Hospital. He is attached to Nanavati Hospital. He has varied experience in various capacities. He has been a research officer in ICMR and WHO. He was associate professor of nephrology at JJ Hospital. He is nephrologist at Malika Hospital in Jogeshwari West and Holy Family Hospital in Bandra. Uh, he has various other attachments. 
and to his credit he has kidney transplants more than 600 in the past 34 years and cadover kidney transplants 30 in the past 10 years so i welcome dr shell shake to talk to us on renal safety in type 2 diabetes mellitus sir please you can share your slides sir ठीक है गुड आफ्टरनून इज माई स्लीड स्लाइड विजिबल यस इट इज विजिबल यू नीड टू एक्सपैंड इट मेक इट स्क्रीन आई वॉज ट्राइंग बट हाउ टू डू इट यू नो आई फेल टू डू दैट वन मिनिट आई ट्राई टू डू दैट this is maximum that i can do uh, sir if you can just click on this slide show icon and see if that works this yes and slide show is uh, there no 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 it's not showing anything about that so okay so i guess we go ahead yeah is that fine now yes yes it is yes 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 uh thank you dr priti bhargava and thanks to gpa for giving me this opportunity to talk on renal protection in type 2 diabetic management uh this has gained tremendous importance in for all of us because as we grow aj we are very high chance of getting type 2 diabetes and uh, kidney involvement is there in almost 40 to 50 percent of type 2 diabetes so this indeed is a growing problem and as you can see 463 millions and uh, over from 1990 to 2019 this 94 percent rise in incidence of diabetes and almost 50% of them, they develop diabetic kidney disease. So that, and hence this, my today's talk is most crucial, not only from patient's point of view, but for our own health point of view also. So diabetes in 62.3% of CKD patients, highest prevalence so far in India. And the next common cause of CKD next to diabetes is hypertension. So diabetic kidney disease indeed shortens the lifespan by 16 years. If one develops CKD, you shorten your life by six years. If you develop diabetes, you shorten it by 10 years. But if you have diabetic kidney disease, 
you shorten your lifespan by 16 years. So the only proven reno treatment for renal protection all these years, as it was seen in by renal and IDNT trials, was ACE inhibitors, that is ACE and RAS blockers. Then there were many new therapeutic strategies uh, were availed, like avosentin, which is non-specific endothelin antagonist, sulodexide, then combination of ACE and ARBs, then ruboxetorin, which is pyruvid kinase C inhibitor, pyrfenidon, which is transforming growth factor beta antifibrotic drug inhibitor, Eliskerin, that is direct uh, renin inhibitor, bardoxolone methyl pathway activator. However, uh, all of them were non promising and did not uh, show us any benefit. But what came as a magic was SGLT2 inhibitors. And how does it work? The most important way by which it works is by glomerular hemodynamics. See, if you study this slide properly, in diabetic kidney disease, the efferent arterial dilates and there is intraglomerular hypertrophy and hyperfiltration, increase in GFR. This is counterproductive. Eventually, it leads to sclerosis and fibrosis and damage of the glomeruli. What SGLT2 does, it does exactly the other opposite thing. It constricts the efferent arteriole, reduces intraglomerular pressure, reduces hyperfiltration, and the adenosine and prostaglandin are increased, reducing effective efferent vasodilatation. So what ARBs are doing or RAS blockers are doing by dilating the efferent dilatation, reducing intraglomerular pressure, it is the SGLT2 is furthermore beneficial not only by dilating the efferent arteriole but by constricting the efferent arteriole. And this it does by what is called as a tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. So this Many renal effects of SGLT2 inhibitors are now proposed. The first, first and the foremost was decrease in intraglomerular pressure, which I discussed in my previous slide, but that is not enough, sufficient. It also reduces albuminuria and oxidant stress. See, SGLT2 co-transporters are in the proximal tubule. And almost 90% of the sugar is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule along with sodium. So almost 90% of the oxygen requirement of the kidney is by the proximal tubule. Once you block SGLT2, all that oxygen requirement is not required. So it, the kidney suffers from less hypoxia and less oxidant stress at the tubular level. So both glomerular path pressure, the mechanism and tubular mechanisms are very, very crucial and important to impart the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitor as a reno protector, as a very important, crucial reno protector. It also reduces intrarenal renin angiotensin upregulation, which RAS upregulation happens in all CKD patients. SGLT2 will reduce it. And obviously, it reduces sugar, reduces hemoglobin A1c, and it removes a lot of interstitial fluid from the body. So the body weight becomes less, the blood pressure becomes less, the arterial stiffness becomes less. And eventually, this leads to decrease in inflammation and fibrosis and excellent reno and cardio protection. So this SGLT2 probably is an excellent uh, weapon that we have in our hand. There were primary renal outcome trials with SGLT2. See, this was found initially, initially because all it is mandatory for all anti-diabetic drugs to have cardiovascular uh, safety trials. And uh, by EMPAR-EG, 
using empagliflozin, we realized for the first time that there was excellent renal benefit. So then there were further studies specifically carried out to find the primary renal outcome or benefit. And that was with credence, with canagliflozin renal events in established diabetic nephropathy, DAPA CKD, and AMPA kidney. These are all robust trials with more than 4,000 patients enrolled. And they varied from credence went up to GFR up to less 30 ml, DAPA up to 25 ml, and AMPA up to 20 ml GFR. And in my day-to-day -day practice, I have continued this SGLT2 even when patient has reached the stage of dialysis, that is 15 ml per minute, as, well as, as long as there is some residual urine output left behind so that glucose can be excreted out. So these three trials have paved our way and have showed that there is a tremendous primary renal benefit of SGLT2 blockers. So the baseline kidney characteristics for RCTs assessing RAS blockade in CKD, as well as RCTs assessing different aspects of SGLT2 inhibitors, is started with various trials like DECLARE. DECLARE was a unique trial which started, which enrolled even with a normal GFR. So they showed us that even if you use upfront SGLT2, and that is what I recommend strongly, when you don't have renal compromise or the GFR is near normal, but there are strong risk factors, strong family history, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, then you are bound to develop a renal problem. So declared, told us that is apagliflozin study. Then of course that Empareg, which I said, which was more for the cardiovascular benefit, then we have Emperor reduced canvas, and the credence and DAPA CKD. Now, going in details about the credence trial, which is canagliflozin renal events in diabetic established nephropathy clinical evidence. It was 690 sites of 34 countries, and it's in, India also was included as one of the country. And it's an absolute robust study. And uh, we started timeline. 2014, where the first participant was enrolled and it was protocol was amended for lower extremity food care because a canvas showed us increased incidence of amputation. So it was mandatory to rule out uh, the lower extremity issues where there is a severe peripheral vascular disease cases. We were excluding uh, this in the credence trial. And the last participant enrolled was at the end of 2017. And the interim analysis was in 2019 and study was concluded in 2019. The baseline characteristics, renal characteristics where the average eGFR was 56 and urine albumin creatinine ratio was uh, from 30 to 3000. So the primary outcome of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine or renal or cardiovascular death, as you can see here, as compared to placebo, there is a marked uh, decrease in the event and uh, p-value is significant and it shows a hazard ratio of less than 1.7 and the p-value of 0.0001 means absolute significant study uh, benefit of uh, SGLT2 blocker to reduce end stage kidney disease or to double creatinine or to reduce renal and cardiovascular death. So, all these uh, slides are showing the same thing. And uh, Credence has established as a very first primary renal oriented outcome study to show renal protection and benefit of SGLT2 to the kidney. So not only that kidneys are benefited, it has also reduced the CV death and all-cause mortality. Along with uh, renal protection, it also reduces albuminuria, as I had said earlier. Now, the only issue is in the first uh, two or three weeks, there is fall in GFR. 
but this fall in GFR is because of the hemodynamic effect. There is no structural damage to the kidney and there is no acute kidney injury. And this fall in GFR stabilizes by 12 weeks and beyond that, as you can see here, that over a period of 42 weeks, the those who were on uh, SGLT2 blockers showed minus 1.85 ml fall in gfr per year we all healthy people lose about 0.75 to 1 ml of gfr every year those who are put on sglt2 lose lost almost 1.85 but as compared to placebo if you were not to treat them then almost 4.59 uh, ml of loss of gfr per year that means you lose around 5 ml of uh, GFR and then you can predict how soon a patient would reach a stage of dialysis. So there's a 60% reduction in the rate of decline in eGFR with canagliflozin. And this is a wonderful slide which showed the same thing what I said earlier that if you were not to treat with canagliflozin over 10 years, you a person would reach the stage of dialysis but having treated with sglt2 you can prolong up to 25 years so you can add on 15 more years for patient to reach the stage of dialysis so prudent showed overall tremendous renal safety and the of course in any drug the safety is crucial like we I said, we've burned our fingers with canvas trial. That is uh, when there was a little increase in the incidence of canagliflozin, uh, incidence of amputation, probably because there were severe peripheral vascular disease cases which were included. So the effects of canagliflozin on kidney and cardiovascular events were consistent between all the age groups. The can effect of canagliflozin on kidney and cardiovascular events were consistent across both the genders and from primary composite outcome according to geographic regions again, all from america to asia all of them got benefited with sglt2 irrespective of the race and religion age and gender so number needed to treat for renal and cardiovascular outcomes over 2.5 years, there were 22 numbers uh, needed to treat to show benefit in one for renal benefits and hospitalization and heart failure, 46 of them. So the blood pressure effects of Kenna and clinical outcomes in type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease showed that blood pressure comes down by the tune of uh, three to four millimeters of systolic and diastolic blood pressure reduction. This is because the interstitial volume comes out through urine and the volume load to the body is reduced. The participants achieving a systolic blood pressure in each study visit during the trial, so uh, they achieved a BP of less than 130 uh, in all canagliflozin's trial. The need for additional blood pressure lowering agents reduced. So the canagliflozin improves blood pressure control and reduces the need for additional blood pressure lowering agents. More specifically, I would say once you put canagliflozin on board, you can take off the diuretics. And uh, even the peripheral edema would reduce without the use of diuretics. The cost effectiveness of canagliflozin added to standard of care for treating diabetic kidney disease in patients of type 2 diabetes, especially now, beyond next to metformin, it is now uh, advocated that atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and CKD patients must receive as a next second line of therapy as SGLT2 blockers, and they get tremendously benefited adding on to the benefit of metformin. So the SGLT2 inhibitors of prevention of kidney failure in patients with type 2 diabetes, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So four studies include, uh, included the CANVAS, Credence for CANA, Declare TIMI, and DAPA CKD, 
and EMPA reg and now EMPA kidney. I mean, all these studies have shown what I have said. And uh, earlier it was thought that these drugs are not effective and the GFR is less than 45 ml per minute, but which is wrong. The EMPA kidney outcome will come out in 2022. Uh, has gone down to GFR of as low as 20. And in my own clinical practice, I have used it even up to GFR of 15 ml per minute with significant benefit. So the summary of effects of SGLT2 inhibitor on major kidney outcomes, it definitely reduces the doubling of creatinine and stage kidney disease and uh, approach to dialysis and cardiovascular and death and overall mortality benefit. So the effect of SGLT2 inhibitors on ESTD, a substantial loss of kidney function, ESKD or death due to kidney disease uh, is all and cardiovascular benefits are established in SGLT2. So the SGLT2 guidelines for CKD and CVD in diabetes, it is highly recommended in all CKDs. It is also highly recommended in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Probably in atherosclerosis, uh, GLP-1 may be a shade better than SGLT2 blockers. So as, but in heart failure, SGLT2 scores over GLP-1 analogs. So the real indications for SGLT2 are in CKD and in heart failure and also in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So canagliflozin is indicated as an agent to diet and exercise to improve glycemic control in adults with type 2 diabetes, to reduce the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, that is non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal stroke, and to reduce the risk of ESR, end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, cardiovascular death. Mind you, I lose almost 50% of my patients before even they reach the stage of dialysis because of cardiovascular death. But what I said, having shown by declared trial, if you have identified the risk factors and before even GFR gets reduced, if you start SGLT2 upfront, you give a tremendous benefit to all the diabetic patients that reduces the risk of developing diabetic kidney disease and it improves cardiovascular and overall mortality. It reduces proteinuria, it reduces blood pressure, it reduces the weight. So all benefits are there. The canagliflozin, uh, you normally should start it as 100 milligram once daily, but the dose can be increased to 300 milligram once daily, depending on the hemoglobin A1C and the glycemic control required. Dosage recommendation for chronic kidney disease and albuminuria, 100 milligram suffices. And even up to 5,000 milligram per gram of creatinine, uh, this canagliflozin reduces proteinuria and is excellent renoprotective drug. Well, I stop here and thank you very much for your patient hearing. And I welcome any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sheth. Uh, any questions from our panelists here? Uh, one of our speakers has congratulated you, sir. Thank, thank you. And probably we don't use this drug in non-diabetics because it would cause hypoglycemia, right? No, that is another very interesting topic, concept now, that not only in diabetic, in non-diabetic kidney disease also, uh, in diabetic, non-diabetic patients, it is found to be helpful. And uh, in proteinuria and non-proteinuria kidney disease. So this drug does not produce hypoglycemia. So Dr. Priti Bhargava, very interesting, very important question you raised. The hypoglycemic, anti-hypoglycemic effect stops when the hemoglobin A1C comes to normal or when the sugar comes to around 120 ml per mil milligram. So there is no risk of hypoglycemia. Okay. And so diabetic, non-diabetic, proteinuric, non-proteinuric, kidney disorder, this is extremely useful drug. Okay. So this was a question from Dr. Vibhakar Adhwari. So thank you, Dr. Adhwari, for this question. Okay. So thanks. Uh, we are running very much in time and we hope to listen to your talk sometime again later. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Much. For old thanks. time's sake. Huh? Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. 
it is wonderful to see you again. Yeah. Thank you. So our next talk would be by Dr. Ravi Shah, who is a consultant orthopedic surgeon attached to Safi Hospital, Sujay Hospital, BACS Hospital in Andheri, Breach Candy Hospital, and Khar Hinduja Hospital. And Dr. Ravi Shah will be talking to us on osteoarthritis of knee. Dr. Ravi Shah, welcome. You can share your screen, please. Thank you, madam. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak to this August uh, uh, crowd of uh, GPA. And uh, I was practicing at Marine Lines uh, four years ago, so was in touch with quite a few colleagues there. But now, uh, more or less, I've shifted base to the uh, suburbs. And uh, on and off, I do come to, uh, I mean, Saifi is a regular OPD. And, uh, you know, do get a chance to interact with uh, many of our colleagues there. So good afternoon to everybody. And I'm going to talk on a very common topic uh, that uh, is uh, prevailing in, in our uh, society. And you as uh, general practitioners are sure to be encountering it every day in and out. Uh, of course, what Dr. Mathur, Dr. Sharad Shet uh, spoke to, was uh, definitely, uh, you know, hardcore medicine. Uh, and for a surgeon like me, it was a uh, few topics of uh, Greek and Latin. But uh, now I'll, I'm going to talk on topics which is very, very common. So let's start uh, uh, on this. So osteoarthritis, as you all are aware, is one of the commonest uh, uh, diseases in uh, general practice besides probably fever, backaches. And uh, uh, definitely we would uh, be, you know, empowered to know more about it. Now, as you all are aware, uh, the Time magazine way back in 2003 had uh, declared it as an epidemic, you know. And as we are going through an epidemic uh, right now, you all, you all would be aware what an epidemic is. And uh, osteoarthritis is a uh, most common form of uh, arthritis occurring worldwide. And uh, females are much more afflicted than uh, males. And <clears throat> most of the patients will be 50, 55 and above with a, a, a prevalence of around more than 40 million in the US alone. So one can imagine the load which would be in a country like India, which has 130, 35 crore of people compared to US, which has around 300 uh, million people. So the costs of osteoarthritis to the patients are heavy, you know, causing limitation to activities, to mental changes, to other joint affliction, etc. And of course, to the exchequer, to the country, it costs uh, more than, you know, $95 billion. This is the US figures. And the worldwide figures is anybody's uh, guess. Now, what, what do I mean by osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is nothing but a degenerative joint disease basically occurring in elderly. Uh, unfortunately, even in the young people nowadays, uh, characterized with articular cartilage erosion, hypertrophy of the bone at the margins, which you see many a times on an x-ray as osteophytes, with subcontinental sclerosis, you know, the white line which is seen, and a range of biochemical and morphological alteration of the sinal fluid, the fluid which basically bathes the joint and which is altered. The rheological properties are altered and there are pathological and pathological changes uh, in subsequent uh, stages will cause ulceration and disintegration of the articular cartilage with decreased range of movement. So this is as per definition, of Kelly's textbook of rheumatology. And despite its prevalence, the precise etiology, pathogenesis, and progression of OA remains elusive. Now, uh, talking on the pathophysiology of it, it's a progressive loss of articular cartilage. The chondrocytes, which produce metalloproteinase that degrade cartilage and cause fissuring, pitting, erosion, and denuded areas. Now, the metalloproteinases are uh, substances which cause these damages. The subchondral bone thickens as a secondary reaction causing osteophytes and sclerosis. The synovium becomes thickened as a secondary measure and 
at times causes a lot of joint effusion. The joint capsule and ligaments can become hypertrophied and stretched, especially if you talk of the most common varus knee, where you see the inner side of the knee getting shortened and the lateral side getting elongated. So the lateral structures have become elongated and the medial side has become contracted. Now, what are the characteristics in uh, osteoarthritic knee? The patient will present with deep aching pain, generally at times poorly localized. In many a times, it can be more uh, commonly seen on the medial aspect of the joint. This may occur in one or both the knees and pain will involve joint and is relieved by rest. It basically aggravated on movement activity, especially climbing stairs if the patellofemoral uh, joint is affected. The stiffness is especially experienced in the morning and after a period of inactivity. For example, patients sitting on chairs for a long time, watching television or in theater cinemas will complain of difficulty in getting up after the show. Aching night pain is also very common, especially turning in bed when one knee touches the other. If the pain is severe on activity and asymptomatic rest, one needs to evaluate for neurogenic claudication. So these things must be borne in mind. And there can be pain coming from the back or even from the hip can be basically referred to the knee joint. So one needs to be really careful in evaluating these symptoms of the patient. Now, <clears throat> why does the patient experience pain? Pain was essentially given by nature to us to bring our attention to any kind of pathology involving any local site. So the cartilage which nature has provided is a neural. That is, there is no neurogenic innovation of the cartilage. So the pain arises from the subchondral bone, which is uh, supplied with enormous amount of nerve endings and the subsequent microfractures, which happen due to repeated loading. The osteophytes are there, which stretch the nerve endings in the periosteum and also the medial or lateral structures where they are located. The ligaments also are innovated with huge amount of uh, neural structures. The joint capsule is extremely sensitive to inflammation and distension. So you will have many a times patients uh, referring pain on the posterior aspect of the knee joint, where uh, they, they will say that this portion is the one which causes pain. Unfortunately, it is the joint on the front which is affected, but because of the arrangement of the uh, nerve fibers, the pain is referred on the posterior aspect many a times. Besides spasm of the muscles, inflammation of the synovium, all these together, and of course, neuronal plasticity, which is central sensitization, which causes pain in the patient's uh, knee. <clears throat> Now, OA pain is a mixed pain, which includes manifestation of both nociceptive and neuropathic mechanisms. In nociceptive mechanism, there is progressive destruction of the articular cartilage with subchondral bone exposure, causing uh, subchondral fractures, formation of osteophytes, and secondary inflammation with other inflammatory substances being released, which causes pain. The neuropathic uh, path causes <clears throat> is due to because of innovation and vascularization of the articular cartilage and compressive forces and hypoxia, which may stimulate these new nerves causing pain even after inflammation has subsided. So uh, the pain of the knee joint is not as simple as one would want to believe. Here uh, uh, is a uh, photograph of the uh, chronicity of the pain and neuroplasticity. Here on the left, is a normal nerve cell and in severe pain it's just a short-term loading and the pain is gone with action stimulus uh, graph uh, shown at the bottom while on your right side uh, the uh, nerve cell is innovated with so many uh, so many gated channels that they open up all sorts of uh, pathways for pain and uh, uh, even at slightest stimulus will uh, cause action potential changes. So uh, uh, here, the high unloading plus the high unloading continues on the uh, knee joint and leads to chronic pain. So as you all one can see, the amount of receptors on the uh, body of the nerve or neuron is enormous. 
and these causes a uh, uh, elevated reaction readiness. So even at the slightest stimulus, the nerve responds in a jiffy and the patient experiences pain. Now, what are the consequences of untreated and un undertreated acute pain? Uh, as as uh, general practitioners, you all, you all must uh, you know be coming across so many patients suffering from pain of various sorts. Here, see the extensive and persistent cascade of neurochemical mediators which are uh, triggered will definitely cause long-term permanent neurological change that can lead to sensitization, allodynia, and hyperalgesia. In osteoarthritis, peripheral sensitization and central sensitization are two mechanisms of underlying pain, which we already spoke to. Now, what causes the destruction? A, the biomechanical forces, uh, and OA is a definitely a mechanically driven disease, as you all are aware, where on the top of this, this is a cut section of the articular cartilage and the bone, where the overlying layer of cartilage is destroyed, exposing the underlying uh, uh, subchondral layer of bone, which has raw nerve endings. And these are the ones which are uh, affected and cause pain. Besides, these also release chemical mediators like cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-4, and all these are the ones responsible for uh, starting the pain cascade. Here, as you can see on the right knee, a varus knee, the uh, inner side or the medial aspect of the knee is shortened and the lateral structure are lengthened. So this also will cause pain. Now, <clears throat> what, who will get knee pain? Is it everyone? No, but there are a few people who are bound to be uh, at high risk. Who are those? People of high age or people really are more liable to get osteoarthritis than younger. Female sex is uh, more prone vis-a-vis -vis the male. Obesity is one of the biggest factors uh, which is uh, likely to predispose one to uh, osteoarthritis. Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis also is a, a bigger uh, challenge to tackle because this will lead to bones which are so fragile and malleable that the deformities are increasing along with the pain. Some occupations demand more knee uh, activity. For example, drivers, people uh, working on uh, their, I mean, having standing jobs for long hours, sports activities and high contact sports activities. Uh, or previous injuries in the younger days can also predispose one to osteoarthritis. Muscle weakness because of lack of exercises. Here, we can work on this factor a lot and uh, uh, prevent uh, further deterioration. There are some people who have proprioceptive uh, deficits, which are quite rare, acromegaly and crystal, uh, calcium crystal deposition disease. But... These three, four factors are one of the most important ones and uh, uh, more liable to uh, make one prone to osteoarthritis. We need to uh, diagnose osteoarthritis, which generally should not be a problem. Taking a proper history, uh, a thorough examination, including uh, seeing the range of movements, the tenderness affected, the warmth, if at all, and collaborating with lab findings, which can be radiology and serology. So, but the most important thing here would be a, clin a thorough clinical examination, along with radiology, will uh, clinch the diagnosis in more than 95% of the cases. In doubtful cases, one can rely on serology to send CBC, ESR, uh, CRPs, and other, uh, other serology investigations as desired. And these are typical osteoarthritic knee. One can see here. Uh, make sure that when you order these x-rays as general practitioners, you must ask for standing x-rays. Many a times we get x-rays where the patients are, you know, just made to lie down in supine position and take an x-rays. Please do not do that because when a patient is taking x-rays uh, standing, we get a true clear picture of the affliction of the knee joint. Because when the knee is loaded, one can uh, actually know the amount of destruction that the cartilage has undergone. So 
this will show you loss of uh, the joint space, osteophytes here with subchondral sclerosis, and many a times one will get geodes, or which are seen, which are nothing but cysts which form in the bone. Also, other part of the bones, also uh, joints may be uh, x-rayed, which will definitely augment one's diagnosis. Now, as we have said that it's uh, both a uh, nociceptive and a neuropathic pain. Uh, I'm sorry, there's some huh, a repetition of these slides. Sorry for that. One can do a synovial fluid analysis. Now, this is especially for patients where Sometimes due to acute exacerbation, the pain may be uh, uh, aggravated and one may confuse the acute osteoarthritis with a pyogenic arthritis because both are going to be warm, both are going to be tender on touch. So one can do safely a synovial fluid aspiration in the clinic with full aseptic uh, precautions and send the synovial fluid for examination besides doing a CBC, ESR and a CRP. After sending the uh, uh, fluid for examination, there are a lot of other parameters that one needs to see. If there are crystals in, uh, seen in the uh, uh, synovial fluid aspiration, uh, one infection uh, cannot be completely ruled out, but crystals generally would mean a, we are, one is dealing with crystal arthropathy. If the WBC count is less than 2000, then which is unlikely to be a infective etiology. In a high WBC count of more than 2000 per uh, millimeter cube, it seems more like a inflammatory arthritis and one needs to rule out sepsis, which is there if the count is more than 50,000. So one needs to now do a differential between an inflammatory and an infective arthritis. So in an infective arthritis, your count will be more than 50,000. While in an inflammatory uh, uh, arthritis, the count may be about 2,000 uh, per m2, but not very high, like in uh, infective etiology. And if there is occult fracture or a derangement of tumor, which is very less likely because one will pick it up on uh, x-rays, one will get a bloody uh, tap and one should uh, think in terms of other etiology of the knee joint pain. Now, what are the treatment considerations that one needs to uh, uh, think of when treating these uh, osteoarthritis? Patients can have either mild to moderate or moderate to severe pain or severe arthritis and <clears throat> with a lot of deformities. Now, uh, I'm sure all of you all must be quite well versed with the treatment pyramid uh, that we used to be taught in uh, undergraduate school where... Uh, uh, here we are coming directly to the uh, uh, medical part, but one definitely needs to tell the patient to change his or her lifestyle along with weight reduction if there is obesity and uh, a change in uh, uh, lifestyle. For example, in today's day and age, smoking has become very prevalent in the younger generation also because in the future, this predisposes to severe osteoporosis and more problems. So uh, one needs to dwell on that part as well. The medical part or the drug part, the paracetamol, and if the renal functions are okay, one can resort to NSAIDs, but to be given very uh, sparingly. Tramadol paracetamol combination is one of the best combinations, pretty safe and uh, controlled. And uh, most of the patients feel quite uh, reasonably, uh, uh, you know, uh, pain-free with these medications. If one needs to up the medications, one can give opioids which are available as patches, as oral uh, medications also, though not that freely as one would want. And if despite all these uh, interventions, the patient still has pain not uh, relenting to these treatment, then surgical option has to be definitely explored. Now, uh, here lies a very big question. Oral medications like paracetamol and NSAIDs, do they help or hurt? I don't know if Dr. Sharad Shet is here, but I'm sure he must be seeing a lot of patients uh, with uh, these problems. And in fact, we even I have a couple of friends 
who are nephrologists and who always are cursing uh, the orthopod saying that you prescribe a lot of NSAIDs and they many a times do see patients who land up with renal nephropathy following medications. Now, is paracetamol effective as a drug? Should it be the drug of choice and is it safe? Now, uh, in a lot of trials, they've come up with the fact that it is absolutely safe and one can go up to four grams per day. Yes, it is four grams per day. So especially for all gender practitioners, one can happily go uh, and give uh, paracetamol, which is pretty safe, you know, safe for in acute or in very bad liver diseases where uh, one needs to be more careful. Otherwise, it should be quite okay to give them uh, paracetamol. Now, the traditional NSAIDs, are they more effective than paracetamol? Are some NSAIDs more efficacious than others? Do I need to elevate the dosage of an anti-inflammatory range? And do NSAIDs destroy cartilage in the long term? See, all this is your slight amount of definitely concern arises in one's mind, especially when one has to give NSAIDs because the elderly, renal compromised patients with gastritis, all these things one needs to take into consideration before giving these because uh, there is some amount of uh, uh, renal involvement on long-term uh, NSAID uh, consumption. However, uh, there is no reliable evidence in human models by clinical trials that NSAIDs are either chondroprotective or chondrodestructive. But we are more worried from the renal and the gastric point of view. So be very judicious in giving these. Now, I'm, I'm sure all of you all are aware of the gastric toxicity, the platelet aggregation, the renal and hepatic dysfunction it causes, and uh, definitely exacerbation of asthma uh, with hyperkalemia, fluid retention, uh, congestive heart failure, hypertension, and sometimes CNS uh, symptoms. So before prescribing NSAIDs, please start off with low doses. If the patient's renal function is uh, reasonably good, then one can slightly step up if uh, the patient has had no relief after giving uh, paracetamol uh, to adequate doses. Now, I'm sure COX inhibitors is very familiar with uh, most of our uh, practitioners. And these <coughs> enzymes break down arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. COX-1 inhibitors are responsible for normal physiologic process like GI protection and platelet aggregation. While COX-2 are the ones which are involved in the inflammatory responses in the body, especially in the joint. So what we are looking at are COX-2 inhibitors, which will block this inflammatory cycle and prevent the inflammation in the uh, knee joint. So these new drugs are either called COX-2 inhibitors or COX-1 sparing. So uh, these are quite commonly used. Now, uh, NSAIDs and gastric protection. Now we need to find out the ones who are at high risk, people who are above 65, people having anticoagulant use, prior GI bleed history, and use of oral steroids. H. pylori also is a harbinger of problems. And if they give history of the same, please be very, very judicious in giving uh, NSAIDs. So here, your drug of choice would be either paracetamol or tra tramadol or tramadol and paracetamol combination along with PPI inhibitors. Now, there are certain things by, uh, which we need to know that chronic users of NSAIDs are three times likely to get adverse GI effect. And they are responsible for a lack, nearly a lack of hospitalization a year in US alone due to GI complications. And there are approximately 16,500 NSAIDs related deaths in the US. And Patients at high risk of GI ulcers include the elderly with a history of ulcers, smokers, and taking steroids, and with the, uh, suffering from severe disability of arthritis or heart disease. Now, mind you, these are all facts and figures which we have derived from the US. So, with given the population here, given the ease with which NSAIDs are available by your friendly neighborhood uh, pharmacist, please be very <coughs> careful and warn your patients also as to the side effects of these because many patients are taking these randomly on their own without any supervision and are likely to land up with trouble. So what is the limitations? 
which uh, of NSAIDs, they are only for mild to moderate pain associated with GI bleed and ulceration, which at times can be life-threatening, causing antiplatelet effect and especially contraindicated in uh, patients who have to undergo surgery, etc., can cause renal impairment and increase blood pressure. And of course, besides other drug interactions. Now, COX-2 inhibitors are also quite widely used, but they have their own uh, limitations, you know. And uh, like all NSAIDs, they also have uh, use only in mild to moderate with uh, GI adverse effects. However, selecoxib and rofecoxib uh, are associated with more cardiac effects than uh, other agents. Like rofecoxib increases blood pressure and, and rofecoxib increases neither blood pressure or are cardioprotective. So, uh, but however, associated with uh, renal impairment and drug interaction. So, theoretically, more or less are on the same block. So, uh, please uh, warn all patients taking these uh, medications, especially patients who've undergone a CABG or who have had a stroke because they can uh, 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 make themselves prone to more cardiovascular uh, risks. So, they, they should be forewarned before. And uh, uh, there are certain uh, NSAIDs who may be li linked to increased uh, myocardial infarction, like rofecoxib, celecoxib, diclofenac, and all. So, uh, in effect, be very judicious in their use. Opioids, one would love to use, however, are quite addictive and are not so easily available in our country and are strictly regulated uh, and not uh, uh, OTC drugs. Now, uh, do uh, opioids have a role in osteoarthritis, especially the chronic ones? Yes, definitely. Some patients may require it for a longer time. For example, tramadol. Now, according to the ACR guidelines, tramadol, when other treatments have failed, are not appropriate. So the American Pain Society's guideline for non malignant pain should be followed. And tramadol is specifically uh, uh, identified by the American College as a initial drug of choice. One may combine it with paracetamol to give uh, effective pain relief. Now, relief is achieved only in 17 minutes as again 15 minutes with paracetamol, with tramadol only. And the median time of supplemental analgesia was 300, 302 minutes as against 122 minutes. So, all in all, a better uh, tolerated drug, a combination of tramadol and paracetamol. Now, uh, tramadol only if a uh, problem is if uh, taken in higher doses, some patients may experience nausea, vomiting, and sometimes some sort of uh, giddiness also since it acts also centrally. So uh, one needs to be slightly, uh, uh, definitely more uh, cautious, but uh, all in all, the safety profile is quite good. Now... This is just the mechanism of action, which I'm not going to uh, talk on. The uh, 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 Many studies have shown the safety and efficacy of uh, tramadol paracetamol uh, combination, which are quite uh, uh, effective. And when are chondroprotective agents like glucosamine or intraarticular hyaluronic acid indicated? As many patients will ask you whether should we take these. Now, glucosamine chondroitin sulfate, all of them have very limited uh, uh, role, though many uh, uh, pharma, uh, pharma companies have come out with a combination and many patients are taking it. Uh, if one strictly sees the uh, JBJS, that is the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery guidelines, their roles are limited. However, in clinical practice nowadays, we are uh, seeing a few patients who do feel good, whether it's a uh, uh, just the uh, placebo effect or no one doesn't know but many a times the patients are not satisfied so before administering them one needs to tell them that they will have no side effects majorly but do not promise them the sky because these are not always effective and there are sparing uh, uh, literature uh, suggesting they are counterproductive effect now it is supposed to stimulate chondrocytes to make proteoglycans and to possibly inhibit cartilage enzymatic activity. 
the sulfate may be the key effect here, but many a times it is largely doubted because all of them get uh, absorbed and destroyed in the GI before it gets absorbed in the bloodstream. So these things are slightly debatable. The same thing with uh, glucosamine, with uh, various data and you know inconsistency in trials, what we have seen. Uh, I, for one, definitely give them glucosamine and um, uh, chondroitin sulfate for six to eight weeks or maybe three months, and we review them. If they are no, not happy, I stop them because if they have to work, they should be kicking in at six to eight weeks. But mind you, do not give them in patients who have severe osteoarthritis. Otherwise, it's a waste of your and their time because here it is never going to work. The another kid on the block is Hyalgan. I'm sure you all must have seen this. It's what is known as visco supplementation. Now, this is a avian source, which is absolutely similar to the synovial fluid that nature gives us. Now, in osteoarthritis, the synovial fluid is basically altered with altered rheological changes. And this is to supplement it. So it is supposed to be chondroprotective. It decreases pain and increases mobility also. So in early arthritis, uh, giving visco supplementation is quite effective and has been recommended by ULAR and American Association as one of the treatment uh, for osteoarthritis. And uh, uh, it has a limit, as in it will be effective for 14 to 15 weeks and needs to be repeated. Okay, Steroids are also effective as intra-articular injections, but not to be given very frequently and with a lot of caution, especially in the diabetics. We, in uh, uh, normal patients, also like to give uh, steroid along with visco supplementation because the steroids are going to help uh, reduce the inflammation quite early. And the long-term effect of the uh, visco supplementation will be over the next few weeks. This has to be given in the uh, knee with full aseptic precautions. One can give it in the clinic, but one should know how to uh, prepare the knee and uh, take all safety measures because infection becomes a big chance if it is given in an inappropriate way and in uh, inappropriate uh, setup. So the question is, when does a general practitioner need to uh, refer these patients to an orthopedic surgeon? Now, one has tried everything, including physiotherapy, patient is not improving, then definitely one has to see the uh, orthopedic surgeon. On examination, one may find a meniscus which is torn, a meniscus which is injured, damaged. You're uh, doing a scopy with either repair or uh, excision will help and removing loose bodies. In patients with deformed uh, uh, knees, uh, for example, in severe virus knees, especially the young ones, one can do what is known as corrective osteotomy a high tibial osteotomy, which can involve either a closed wedge or an open wedge osteotomy. And uh, these are quite prevalent, especially in the younger patients. And uh, today we are doing a lot of unique compartmental knee replacement where we change only the involved uh, joint and uh, the patients are back on activity quite fast. And these last for quite a long time and uh, the recovery is very quick. And of course, for severe tricompartmental osteoarthritis with destroyed joint, our only recourse remains the total knee replacement, where we uh, change uh, all the three compartments, and uh, the patients are. Uh, we've got immense amount of literature on this with a high rate of success, but definitely we have our shares of problems as well. So, before offering this, make sure. The patient is aware that we are doing this to give him or her relief from pain and not to promise them the sky of uh, allowing them to bend the knee, flex the knee, do uh, sitting cross-legged, etc., which are all uh, things which are sold to the patient. So please do not promise them the sky and uh, uh, make sure that the patient knows what he or she is in for. Thank you.
हेलो सॉरी सॉरी आई वाज आई वाज ऑन द म्यूट सो या देयर आर अ फ्यू क्वेश्चंस फॉर यू डॉक्टर रवि थैंक्स फॉर दैट ब्यूटीफुल टॉक द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन वुड बी अपार्ट फ्रॉम स्टैंडिंग एक्सरे व्हाट अबाउट स्काई व्यू skyline view also yeah. is required especially when one is suspecting uh, the uh, patellofemoral arthritis so a uh, ap lateral and a skyline view is the standard norm which we take uh, for all patients uh, presenting with osteoarthritis of the knee madam uh, there is another question how about physiotherapy in mild osteoarthritis like yes, quadriceps yes. exercises yes, yes absolutely it's a part of the armamentarium madam Uh, uh doing good amount of physio because patients run out of uh, patience you know they say hum itna 10 bar ja ke aaye i mean 10 times or whatever they will give you a figure but that is not enough you know and one needs to follow it up with exercises at home as well which is very rarely done you know and more important along with conjunction of physio one needs to lose weight i'm sure in your practice uh Uh, you all must have noticed the amount of patients with uh, uh, obesity has gone up tremendously so you know these are more and more prone to get uh, knee pain so please advise them to lose weight also simultaneously probably see a dietitian to suggest uh, uh, a diet which is suitable to their taste and their liking and sir one last question any role of knee braces uh knee braces are generally not advocated because they are uh, you know surprisingly uh, liable to cause more muscle wasting so uh, unless and until the patient is very adamant does not want to do surgery despite the fact that he or she has bad uh, osteoarthritis then uh, you know one can use it occasionally where uh, one needs to go for a function or some sort of uh, full day activity but uh, generally not advocated you know because it leads to more muscle wasting madam yeah. so sir uh, there has been appreciation on of your talk on the chat box thank you very much for this talk sir thank you madam okay we are in time and now we come to the last talk of the day uh, which will be taken by dr navita purohit uh, it also relates to pain pain management but this is a different type of pain uh, dr navita is consultant in rehabilitation medicine at kokilabai thirubai amani hospital she is a specialist of pain management and palliative care she is program head of fellowship in pain pain medicine at iapm that is indian academy of pain management she is honorary secretary of indian association of physical medicine and rehabilitation and i invite dr navita to talk to us on recent updates in pain management uh dr navita was here what happened i don't know thank you so much oh yes she is yes yeah. Yeah. thank you so much dr bhagav and uh, very good evening to all and uh, i would be talking about pain management what are the recent advances in pain management i'll just share my screen I'm so sorry for uh, for the delay, but yes, now I'll share my screen. And, uh, yeah, is it? Yes, it is visible. It's visible. Yeah, you can enlarge it if you want to. Yep, that's right. so yeah so i will skip these slides as already have been introduced so my talk would be on um, what are the recent advances on pain management or pain medicine when we say so my talk i would be covering about what is the need of interventions 
what is interventional pain management? I'll be discussing few cases just to understand how we can go about when a patient comes to you because the first point of contact is all of you who are sitting here uh, who come to you as a for their pain management and what is the role of regenerative medicine that is platelet rich plasma injections? What are the procedures that can be done and what are the indications? So uh, we all know when a patient of pain comes to us, we do follow this uh, step ladder approach of following, giving them with some, some uh, analgesics with non-opioids or weaker opioids. They come back, we, we tell them to go for a physical therapy and a weaker opioids. Otherwise, then we say, okay, if they have a back pain or a, or a, or a uh, neck pain and they have a disc, then we tell them to go for a surgery for the path of recovery. So that is the path of recovery. But what happens to the patient when we tell them, okay, please, now you need a surgery and there are no red flags and you need to go for the surgery because the pain is not getting better. But, the, but for the patient, it is a world of misery. The patient... There are so many, the, the, we are surrounded by doctors everywhere because our neighbors are also patient. We, we learn from everyone. When we talk to, to the, when we share our experiences, when the patients, they talk to their, their relatives, they share their experiences. Some are good and some are bad. So they always take the bad experiences and, and they are in a dilemma, what to do, whether the surgery is needed or not. So that is where the question arises, how do I go about it? So here to bridge the gap between the pharmacological and the surgical management comes the role of interventional pain management. What is interventional pain management? These are basically minimally invasive procedures which give permanent or long-term pain relief by stopping the nociceptive inputs or correcting the neuropathy. So it fills up the gap between the pharmacological management and the surgical management. Interventional pain management, they are usually guided procedures. So image guided, so we can actually see what, where our needle is going and we can target the area, which is a pain generator and then inject around that area. So we do it with fluoro guided, my forte is ultrasound guided. It can be CT guided also. In the ultrasound, it's a real time guided uh, injections or blocks. What we do, it's it, we can see each and every nerve, muscle and the joint or the bone and the ligaments as well. I'll be discussing a few cases and how we can help the patients with pain with this image-guided technique. Um, it's, this is a very common case, 34-year-old male with no comorbidities, comes to, the, to our OPD with low backache, radiating to the left lower limb, and it's been a long term. Uh, you have been seeing this patient. patient is, the pain is along the L5 dermatome. There's paresthesia and numbness, and he cannot walk for more than 500 meters. And because of this, this gentleman, he had been suffering for a longer time, long period of time, and, and so much so that he had taken all the conservative management, NEMA medicine, and he had already taken it, weaker opioids, adjuvants, and a physical therapy. But he was so much devastated that he, st he thought of stopping to going to office because he was his job was more of a driving and then uh, walking and and because he couldn't walk he couldn't drive so he he was thinking of leaving his job and looking at his uh, SLR so we can see that the left side if the the the, the, the leg SLR is is totally normal on the unaffected side but it's it's affected on the on the left side and MRI is suggestive of L4, L5 disc, which is causing compression, not only central, but also on the causing compression on the exiting nerve root. So what did we do is we did an ultrasound assisted fluoro guided um, L5 nerve root block. We can see it's a beautiful dye spread of the dye in the L5 nerve root. And we do it with ultrasound. We can see the needle coming. It's all gray, but it helps a lot. This is where it is more visible and um, nicely visible. And, and after we came back, we can see that the SLR improved, his range of motion improved, and he joined back his back, uh, job. And on, because he was young, so the need of giving that injection was only once, and he still has been years together, and the need of injection is not needed. So this is how we can help these patients with pain who come with severe radiculitis. 
uh, this gentle, this lady, 62 year old lady, she was diagnosed as a, a type 5 radiculopathy. And uh, we can see how she's walking. There's a lot of antalgic gait. She's not putting weight on, on the limb because of pain in the back and it's radiating to the lower limb. But uh, when examining the, the nature of the pain was not in a dermatomal pattern. It was more mainly uh, along just above the heel and she needed support even. She came on a wheelchair and she was, uh, she was um, uh, referred for, uh, for a transforaminal epidural because looking at later MRIs, there's a multiple disc bulges L4, L5 and L5S1 with compression. But clinical examination suggested that there was a tenderness in the piriformis in the gluteal region and, and the pain was not coming. There was no dermatomal pattern. So we changed the diagnosis and we gave a, to, a, to piriformis syndrome and we gave uh, ultrasound guided piriformis muscle injection. That's the needle coming. That's a static image. And that is the ischial um, spine. And that's the piriformis muscle. And that's the gluteus media, maximus muscle. But we can identify the piriformis muscle and we can inject into the muscle. And after the injection, she was she walked back home happily. She came on wheelchair and she walked back home happily. So that is how we don't treat the, the MRI, but the but the clinically we, we treat the patient, but rather than not under the MRI. Similarly, um, we do get patients of headaches. They are um, mostly diagnosed as migraine. And this gent this lady was also 45 year old lady. She was diagnosed as migraine and she was taking popping pills from last 10 years. She had good days and bad days. And when she came to emergency, she had bad headaches. It was unilateral and any any headache, if you have a headache, you will never like any noise or light. Or, so that's the same. Similarly, she also did not like any noise. The light and the room, she wanted a dark room. And when we examined, there was a severe tenderness on the neck and compressing the greater occipital nerve, which is at the level of greater occiput or the occipital protuberance. So she was, the diagnosis was again changed to greater occipital neuralgia. And we did a ultrasound guided greater occipital nerve block with ultrasound. We can actually see the nerve in the artery over here and we inject around the nerve and it helps in reducing the frequency and intensity of the headaches. And she started having a better quality of life then. So, and followed by good physical therapy. Now, it's not only the the day-to-day, -day, the headaches and the, the back aches, but also patients with cancer pain. They do come to us and um, when they come to you, what what do we do if the patient of uh, uh, this gentleman, this lady, she was 62 year old and diagnosed of advanced carcinoma pancreas and there was multiple meds. She was done some, some surgery followed by chemo, but she was admitted in the ER for severe pain abdomen, which was continuous and in the upper part at the area of the pancreas. We started on um, opioid medications, IV opioid, which she was on continuous IV opioid, but patient had no relief. That was the time we took a decision of giving a, a sympathetic block, that is the celiac plexus block, a diagnostic block. Here is the celiac plexus, which is done with ultrasound. Again, we can see that's the the, the the aorta, the it's the celiac trunk can be seen over here, and and this is where we we do the injection. So we do a local anesthesia, and if they respond, then we do a neurolytic block in patients with cancer pain. And we did a, a neurolysis by phenol, and patient lived for four months, but she was very much pain free. The need of opioids um, was negated, and also when we last followed up. We got a, a, um, on phone, the, the son told that she had died peacefully and the sufferings were over. So this is where the cancer pain patients, they do need the pain management because they know that life is limited, but the quality of life has to be much, much better. And we can improve this uh, by using the interventional pain procedures. This patients, they come to you and um, might be coming to you with shoulder pains and and uh, restriction of the shoulder pain here. We can see he's not able to do overhead abduction as well as flexion. And um, in, the, in these, the internal and external rotation. So adhesive capsulitis is very common in diabetics, middle age, 
um, person not able to do his day-to-day -day activities, left-handed, so not able to do his activities. So what we can do for this procedure done, all these patients had uh, underwent a conservative management and then referred for pain management. So again, what we can what can we offer them is a suprascapular nerve block under ultrasound guidance. So we can actually see the nerve in the artery in the suprascapular notch and we inject um, around the nerve to block the fibers to the shoulder and uh, also AC joint and the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus, the rotator cuff. So this is what we did in this, there's the supraspinatus notch and we give the injection around the nerve and patient made a very good um, response. We can see that who was not able to do a flexion and abduction was uh, limited, he is doing circumduction. So this is one month follow-up. And we can see the abduction. So both uh, abduction is he's able to do. Then we do get these kind of patients where the patient, there's a lot of allodynia, hyperesthesia, severe uh, swelling of the upper limb or the lower limb. And we do each and every investigation, which is normal. And it turns out to be CRPS. So this gentleman, 65 year old, most commonly after stroke, it can be after any injury. So she, this gentleman had stroke with the left hemiparesis and he was left-handed. So he, he came, his, he recovered very well from the stroke, the power he got back, but the pain in the shoulder and the hand, it remained. And we can see that there's a swelling in the shoulder and the, in the swelling in the wrist. And that is why he was not able to make a fist. And his day-to-day -day activities or the activities of daily living, like fine motor activities, like buttoning, unbuttoning, eating, it all was affected. And he was, the whole family was helping him. And uh, for him, again, the, he was uh, diagnosed as CRPS post-stroke. And it is again a sympathetic plexus block in the upper limb that is a stellate ganglion block. That's the carotid artery. We can actually see this is the, the needle tip and that's the injected, which is going into the pre vertebral fascia and um, blocking the uh, middle cervical sympathetic block. And we can see that after the injection, he is able to take the, the hand, the ROM improved in the shoulder. And also, there's a lag in the closing of the fist, fisting is not able to do and after the injection he was able because the, the edema was uh, reduced we can see the wrinkles over here and the pain was reduced and so he's able to was able to do his activities of daily living and the dependency on the patients on the on the uh, caregivers also reduced sometimes the patients do come to you with the pain with dysuria frequency frequency of urine pelvic pain um, mostly females and they we treat them as UTI, we send them to urologist, to gynecologist. The, the, the pain keeps on increasing. They are they undergo an area of testing, but then they are the diagnosis they don't get and they keep on wandering from one doctor to another. So um, this should come into our mind that it can be a chronic pelvic pain or a bladder pain syndrome because there is something wrong inside um, the gag layer. And this is what we are dealing with. So this lady is was diagnosed with bladder pain syndrome. He was she was uh, she was suffering from last one and a half years. People do come suffering from last twenty years, but the diagnosis is not made. And most of them they do uh, go for minimum five to ten doctors before being diagnosed. So this was duration was two years. The pain was burning in the perineum, inner thigh. And because it was there for a long period of time, it was radiating to the back. She could not sit. It, it was relieved. Usually these patients, they have some relief of pain after bladder emptying, but the bladder filling is what is painful. So they are very afraid. They sit on, sit in the toilet for a long period of time and they keep on going to the toilet. And that is how bad the quality of life is when, when they cannot even uh, the urine passing is the worst for them. So an examination, there was a suprapubic tenderness and myofascial bands on suprapubic and inner thigh. For vaginal examination was suggested that there was an active trigger point visit. So we did an ultrasound guided trigger point injection and 
um, and release the bands. I'm sorry, the video is not not playing, and uh, the pain reduced significantly while the urologists were doing their hydrodistinctions and all. Um, this is most common, I think. So, in amongst uh, pain patients, eighty percent of the patients they come with knee pain and osteoarthritis of knee, osteoarthritis of hip, and anywhere, but most commonly is the knee osteoarthritis, they do come to you. And this is sometimes the picture is this, sometimes it is the early beginning of the osteoarthritis. So um, this, this lady, she was, she came from out of, from abroad and, and uh, she came in this fetal position. She had multiple, she had dementia, 86 year old, bed bound from last one and a half years. And we can see the contractures in the knee and the hip. Um, on examination, she was she was not able to she was not letting the therapist to make extend the knee, and she was referred for the knee pain to me. So we did a, a ultrasound guided platelet rich plasma injection into the knee, and uh, we already discussed with the relatives that we are not because she is osteoporotic. There's a dementia. 86 year old, not worked for one and a half years. We are doing this injection just for reducing the pain and improving the quality of life and also perennial hygiene. Uh, to our um, surprise, the, the patient did very well and even she went home walking with support. With support, but she went home walking. So a simple PRP injection does a lot. This, this gentleman, he also came from abroad and we can see how his gait is. He had uh, end-stage liver disease with stroke, with he's not able to walk. You can see the power is not there, but then the pain is also not letting him because the gait has, is not, he's not taking full weight on the knee. So we went ahead and did ultrasound guided PRP injection in the knee. And this is how we do it. It's the ultrasound. It's very, it's very less painful because it's a guided injection. We do it in the suprapatellar pouch. This is how where the needle is going. We know where the needle is going. And and after injection, this is post PRP. We can see that how the space is clearing in the X-ray after after uh, this is after two months uh, on the right side and the left side where the, there was no space. In the medial compartment, we can see some space coming out after the three, three months of the X-ray. And uh, the, the gait also improved now, the, the need of support reduced and he's taking more weight on the um, left side, the lower limb. This lady, she comes, we do say that the alignment doesn't change. Maybe this is not a weight-bearing x-ray. That's why it's it's showing like this. But this is how we could see that after six months, the, the after PRP injection, we can see the osteopenia and all the, the mineralization is getting better. The, 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 uh, the, the space is getting better. So if in x-ray, if we can see gross changes, then maybe MRI is a better um, to let us know how things are improving. So um, this is how we do. This is a last case which I would like to discuss here that uh, the, this gentleman, he had um, a brain tumor and he was given, a surgery was done for him and radiation was given to him. After that, when he came for a neuro rehabilitation, but we found out that he was not able to open his mouth. There's a lot of Christmas. That is where... Um, I was called for and so we could help him because he was not eating. He had a peg tube and because of this uh, Christmas, he was not able to eat or uh, there was only liquid or sips uh, with straw. He could take some liquids and that is less than one finger breath. He cannot eat. And when we did a CT, there was a osteoarthritis at the TM joint. We can see that, and we did an ultrasound guided PRP injection into the TM joint bilateral. Followed by this, after one month, we can see how much mouth opening is there, and he started eating. His peg tube was removed. He went home eating. We we don't know the importance of all the activities of daily living, which we do day every day as a spinal uh, thing. But when we lose this, then we realize how important this is. So uh, he started eating, and he was very happy because the pain was reduced. 
then the patient do come to come with shoulder pain or any ligament injury muscle tears so this gentleman we can see that he is not able to um, uh, take his uh, this he he had stroke uh, the but the whatever power he had he could not utilize because of the pain there is a less than 30 degree of um, abduction in the shoulder we can see there is a tear in the supraspinatus muscle when we did a diagnostic ultrasound and we did again into the supraspinatus muscle we did PRP platelet rich plasma injection and we can see whatever power he had he was able to use pain was reduced and the range improved so he was and this again this lady she had we can see it's a full thickness tear of a supraspinatus this blackish area over here we did a PRP for her and we can see that when she came back after six months then we could see some fibers growing back so there is this is what the regeneration the platelet rich plasma does. What exactly is this? This is simply the whole blood that is centrifuged to create an increased concentration of platelets. It can be with or without WBC. And it's basically the activation of the platelets and release of the various growth factors that makes them special. And that's the key to enhancing the tissue repair. And this is how we do in our center. It's just the venous blood. We take out around 25 ml of blood and inject it's a closed system and all the sepsis it's it's completely closed there is no chances of any infection or getting it in, in, in outside infection to be spilled over here and we do a double centrifuge and take out the platelet rich plasma over here and immediately we inject into the area along with the use of guidance with the ultrasound so that is what um, the interventions, they do help. It can be in the form of musculoskeletal injections within the muscles because of the trigger points or the myofascial bands. It can be nerve blocks. It can be in the spine or it can be regenerative medicine in the form of platelet-rich plasma. This is where we, we say this is the first um, radiation-free pain clinic where we do our procedures with the ultrasound and uh, it's like a daycare and we have come up with a radiation-free pain clinic. We do all kinds of procedures for um, patients with pain, spinal procedures like transfer aminal epidural, caudal epidural, facet for the um, joint, uh, facet joint uh, pain, facetal pains, median branch block for again for the facetal pains. For the radiculopathies, you know, transfer aminal epidurals and the lumbar canal stenosis, caudal epidurals, they do help. Then uh, SI joint, again, 40% of the patients, they do have pain with due to SI joint. So we do in SI joint injections and intratestinal procedures. If we see that in the injections with the, um, the joint is getting better, but they come back and we do, we burn the nerves with radiofrequency ablations of these nerves uh, that can be seen over here. And uh, which again, it works for a longer period of time. Patients with the, uh, uh, chronic pancreatitis or GI uh, malignancies, upper GI malignancies, celiac plexus, neurolytic blocks for CRPS or uh, from head and neck cancers, steroid ganglion blocks, they do help for CRPS of lower limb or um, any peripheral vascular disease, pain due to vasculitis, lumbar sympathetic plexus block, they do help and uh, pain due to uh, rectal or anal malignancies or uh, recurrent or uh, refractory coccidinias, ganglion impal blocks, they do help a lot in these kind of patients. In all kind of peripheral nerve blocks, it can be some, some malignancies like pancos tumors or her post herpetic neuralgias, they do very well with intercostal nerve block. Uh, cervicogenic headaches, even migraines, they do very well with a greater occipital nerve block. Then um, patients, they do, when they come to you after uh, hernia repair and, and severe pain in the area where the uh, surgery was done, so there is some nerve entrapment or um, uh, ileoinguinal or iliohypogastric nerve entrapment. We can do, if I actually see the iliohypogastric nerves and then inject around the nerves and then uh, release the entrapment by doing hydrodissection. Meralgia parasthetica, because nowadays with the low waist trousers or the jeans, I'll call back. Uh, this thing, we can do hydrodissection lateral from the cutaneous nerve of thigh. So we can actually identify all the nerves, the vessels, the muscles, and then inject around that. So this is what the pain management thing when we do in, 
in cochlear in hospital we deal with we do deal with all kinds of pain whether it is spinal neuropathic musculoskeletal cancer pain pelvic pains and even headaches these are all the indications which we have already discussed any kind of degenerative disc disease axial neck pain radicular pain um any neuropathic pains um, we can do more than than the conservative management like scar neuralgias nerve entrapment trigeminal neuralgias they are they have severe pain they can't eat they can't talk these are the patients we can do radio frequency ablation of the trigemin of uh, the cascadian ganglion post herpetic neuralgias atypical facial pain and central pain due to after any head injury or thalamic syndromes fibromyalgias myofascial pain syndrome tendinopathies arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis cancer pain in itself is a is is a disease and it can be due to the disease or due to the treatment the pain chronic pelvic pain again it's it's very difficult to treat but we can help them with improving their quality of life by doing some myofascial blocks migraine again um, botulinum toxin injections it is usfd approved and greater occipital nerve blocks even cervicogenic headaches they can be helped up so this is the area of this is the all the indication where wherever we can go ahead and put a needle and then um, help the patients with pain to improve their quality of life and uh, that's a team work which we which we do because uh, pain relief is not a one person's um, job it's actually a multidisciplinary and a multimodal approach where a pain physician like me and a uh, referring doctors like you pain nurse counselors because pain a uh, chronic pain is is a disease in itself so it affects the psyche also so we do need some counseling and followed by a physical therapist because the muscles and the they need to be endured and strengthened and the, nowadays with work from home the patients they do have bad backs and bad postures they are sitting for a long period of time in front of the on the laptop and they are working and they do come with my facial pain syndrome this is where the occupational therapist they help us help to tell the right ergonomics so basically so this is how we bring back a, a smile on the face of all the patients who are suffering from pain because uh, pain relief is basic human right thank you so much any questions i'll be happy to answer yeah thank you very much dr namita uh navita sorry mm-hmm. uh dr navita uh, i had a question do you uh, since you work with palliative care yes. uh, do you have a team that goes to patients houses to give pain relief mm, we don't have in you know, cochlear band we don't have a home care unit but we do follow up with the uh, phone calls or we tell the patients uh, we do liaise with the gps and we tell them what to do when there is an emergency the relatives they do come to us in the opd and uh, that is how we 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 are developing we are thinking on developing the home care units as well the home care unit is still not there but we have a lot of uh, cancer patients and palliative care patients with us but yes we do do not have a home care unit we are talking about it telephonically so dr avisha would want to know do we have consistent relief from prp treatment yes that's a very good question but uh, it's it depends on if we have a degenerative disease it depends on what is the stage of the disease so if the earlier the stage the more uh, uh, long or lasting is the prp injection relief so if we are at uh, all my patients they are at grade 3 grade 4 and all those who have comorbidities not able to go for surgeries they do get when we say we we say it's a kl staging grade 3 they get relief of 3 months if this is 4 it can be 6 months but if there it is followed by physical therapy i have all my patients they come back after a year or so so it's like a few months to years together in grade 2 earlier then i'm sh- i'm sure we can negate the use of surgery so it's told it's now uh, called as don't replace but to regrow so if you keep on giving the prps using the prps it's natural way of healing so it will help us um, rejuvenating our own uh, knees which we have which god has given us rather than using a uh, orthosis from outside uh, since dr ravisha is here dr shiva would you be able to answer two quick questions please if 
you can unmute yourself. Yeah, madam. Yes, Dr. Shah, there is one question uh, which says any relation of long walks of 15 to 17 and uh, minutes and knee arthritis? Uh, see, basically, we encourage patients to strengthen their quadriceps, madam. <clears throat> when one is walking and especially long walks, uh, you're basically using your quadriceps nicely. So even if you see in the physio rehab, the basic emphasis is on strengthening the quadriceps uh, muscles, madam. So uh, definitely walks will definitely help strengthen the quadriceps and uh, delay the onset of uh, OA knee, madam. Okay, and one last question for you. Does curcumin have any role as chondroprotective for cartilage? Gee, gee. Now, uh, there has been a sudden surge of all these products, you know. Uh, even uh, the uh, curcumin, we have the common, uh, um, um, I forget the generic uh, name, Singh. Um, uh, Moringa, you know, sticks. Right, All of right. them have uh, been proven to have immense anti-inflammatory activity, madam. Now, just yesterday, somebody told me the curcumin tablets. I asked him the cost. He's saying 10 tablets, 750 rupees. And uh, I don't know how am I going to sell 10 right. tablets of curcumin to my patients saying hey, this is our uh, household haldi. So he'd rather say hey, man, sab, I'll get it from my friendly neighborhood Baniya at uh, 1000 the cost of what you're selling me so it becomes a bit difficult but there are you know very varied uh, results on all this with no definite scientific evidence to say that it'll help but um, uh, it, i mean again at the same time nothing to refute it as in it will not cause any damage and surprisingly some patients we still need to uh, basically filter them out and find out do, do get relief so we are still not there completely with the data to say who will benefit and who will not. Thank you, Dr. Shah. And thank you, Dr. Navita Vyas. And I would request our uh, honorary secretary, Dr. Pragji Vaza, to please propose a vote of thanks. <clears throat> Hello. Yes, yes, Dr. Vaza, you are audible. Yeah, you have muted yourself now. Yes. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, first of all, let me thank all of our esteemed distinguished speakers, Dr. Raju Mate, Dr. Sharad Shet, Dr. Ravisha, and Dr. Navita Puroj for their excellent and marvelous talk on their respective subjects. There was a lot many take home messages, and it was uh, they have touched upon the subject in uh, uh, from GP point of view very well. I think uh, we all are fortunate to have such esteemed speakers for the day. Equally, I thank uh, Johnson & Johnson Pharma Company for their wonderful participation in our uh, today's program. And uh, on this occasion, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Vikram and especially uh, Mr. Asis, who is with us today for this, our CME. Of course, uh, how can I forget our moderator, Dr. Priti Bhargav, for our excellent uh, and graceful uh, moderation of the program and uh, and last but not the least uh, all our participants who have uh, uh, joined us for the program and uh, once again i thank uh, uh, all of our esteemed speakers and the johnson and johnson pharma company and of course glexo pharma also for their uh, wonderful participation in today's program i equally thank dr janaksha for uh, managing the uh, this uh, webinar CME from his corner. And I also thank our president, Dr. Uh, Bharat Bhatt, for his uh, kind uh, participation for the program and uh, uh, active involvement in the program. Once again, I thank all our speakers and you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Shah, Dr. Vyas, and Dr. Vaz. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Vaja, Dr. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.